morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. The Frick Pittsburgh occupies ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee peoples. As a place of history and nature, the Frick recognizes the cultural importance of land and the role of cultural institutions in the formation of collective memory. Displacement and erasure are not just histories for Native peoples. Land acknowledgements, like historic sites themselves, are exercises in preservation and reconciliation engaged with past, present, and future. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Dawn Green, and I am the Chief Curator and Director of Collections at the Frick Pittsburgh. I'll go over a couple of housekeeping items before we get started, although I think a lot of us are very, very familiar with Zoom at this point. We have closed captioning tonight, and you can turn it on or off with the menu at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will be taking your questions and answers. You can put them directly into the chat or into the Q&A. My friend and colleague, Lisa Viscusi, is off camera tonight, but we will both be monitoring the chat throughout the program. And we're going to save some time for question and answer at the end of the program. So my team is really hard at work this week, preparing our galleries for our next exhibition, American Perspectives, Stories from the American Folk Art Museum. It will open on Saturday, October 15th, and we'll be having an opening celebration on Friday, October 21st, and I hope you all can join. This exhibition is drawn from the extraordinary collections of the American Folk Art Museum in New York, with very generous support provided by Art Bridges. It is an incredible overview of folk art from the earliest days of the founding of the United States to the present. And it's the first presentation of folk art in the Frick's history. So this is really exciting for us. And because it's so new to us and our audiences, we wanted to do a pre-program to talk about folk art. What is it? What makes it different? Why are we so excited to have it in our galleries? So joining me tonight is Emily Javolt, Curatorial Chair of Collections and Curator of Folk Art at the American Folk Art Museum. Often looking at earlier material through the lens of 20th century histories of collecting and collective memory, her work encompasses research interests in 18th and 19th century American decorative painting, portraiture, African-American material culture and representation, and the colonial revival movement. Javalt received her BA in Art History and Theater Studies from Yale University and her MA from Winterthur Program in American Material Culture. She's previously held positions at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and Christie's New York. Javalt is a doctoral candidate at the University of Delaware in the Art History Department, where her work has been supported by an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Fellowship. Her dissertation is titled Unseen New England, Identity and Exclusion in Early American Art and Material Culture. Looking through the lens of race and the construction of social hierarchy, her project investigates the conflicting forces of predominantly white New England memory making and the collective forgetting of black and native histories through a transtemporal study of some of the region's earliest images. It's a really incredible project, which we just heard is going to be turned into a catalog and an exhibition next year. So hopefully we'll get a few more details. We're so honored to have you with us tonight, Emily. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dawn. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm especially excited to be able to talk about the field of collecting folk art um, to an audience who um, is about to see this show, but to an audience for whom perhaps the field is not as familiar. Um, I think you'll have a new group of enthusiasts after after this program and after this show. <laughs> well, so we I really want so. I want to start with what seems like it will be a very easy and simple question on the surface, but I, I'm sure in your answer, we'll hear a little bit more about how amorphous the term folk art is. So what exactly is folk art? What kind of artwork is encompassed in that category? Yes, this is such a good question and it is really a deceptive one. It seems like it should be very simple, but um, I'm gonna share actually um, a few slides with you all so that you can be um, so that you can enjoy looking at some 
visual components while we talk about this. Um, I think, you know, fundamentally, it's really what's really key to understand about folk art is that this is not, you know, what we would call a natural category, right? It's not a category like chair or table or even, you know, painting that would allow for um, uh, kind of a, a definition that's, 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 um, uh, has a, a finite beginning and an end. Um, it's really um, a category that um, is quite expansive. And um, because it was developed by collectors, um, <clears throat> forgive me, bear with me just one moment. I'm just trying to, um, just having a little bit of a challenge pulling up the PowerPoint, but in one moment, I will have it for you. Um, so it encompasses just this huge range of categories, including everything from quilts to portraiture, um, needlework pictures, and weather vanes. And I'm sharing some examples here from AFAM's own collections. Also things like trade signs with this tooth that you're seeing on the left and um, objects of, of sort of ephemera of everyday life, like this amazing Valentine um, that was created in a Pennsylvania German community um, in the late uh, 18th century. And so you can see through this range of objects, really, I think, um, that uh, this is an umbrella term and it encompasses really anything and everything that collectors seized on as a way of representing a non-academic pre-industrial uh, American past. So the collectors and dealers um, and coalesced, um, there, were, there were antecedents uh, to thinking about um, what folk culture was, but really coalesced in the 1920s and the 1930s concurrently with a movement to start focusing on the collecting of American decorative objects. Um, so you see that sort of happening, the collecting of high style Americana at the same time as we're starting to see this real interest in collecting American folk art. Um, and it was really a way to construct a distinctly American sense of heritage. There was at this moment in time, a little bit of an inferiority complex amongst Americans that they didn't share this kind of storied um, uh, history that, that European countries had. And there was kind of a sense of who are we as Americans? I will say, these are, you know, this is a conversation primarily being driven by white, um, uh, Euro Americans um, who who were thinking about this. So fundamentally, the you know the the um, the category did leave out um, uh, a number of Americans, but um, it was it was really a response as well to kind of a changing pace of life and a sense that you know with new technologies like the automobile and electricity in the early 20th century, we're starting to um, feel that the pace of life is picking up and, and Americans wanted to kind of look back with a sense of, um, you know, uh, manifested through actual objects of a simple, a seemingly simpler time. Um, so that's really where the, the urge to, um, to collect American folk art began. Um, but I'll say that, you know, um, it encompasses, uh, and this has been the source of a lot of contention among scholars, um, it encompasses objects that we would consider um, kind of um, uh, objects of a closed community that was um, kind of operating outside of the context of um, uh, mainstream dominant American culture, like Pennsylvania German fractor. Um, and I think you would have, an, anthropologists would agree that this constitutes some some kind of folk culture, but it, be, it started to become a bit controversial when collectors and dealers started talking about um, commercially made objects as folk art, things like weather vanes, carousel figures, and portraits, which are you know all fundamentally objects that were made for commercial exchange. Um, but all of these things were collected by um, collectors and dealers who identified themselves as folk art collectors beginning in the early 20s and 30s. Um, so you'll see a range of objects falling into these subcategories as well as others um, when you walk into American perspectives. Um, but I think, you know, it's important to acknowledge that this is a constructed category. And so there's not an easy answer to what is folk art because it, it really reaches across such a broad um, range of, of objects made for different purposes. 
Yeah, I've heard someone say that folk art, you know it when you see it, even if you can't really define it. Um, yeah. And there is something, there is like a feeling that unites these artworks and this show in particular, I think, is just going to be really fantastic for folks to see. So how do you really think about that category of folk art now com compared to how it was originally conceived? Because I know today there are self-taught artists or artists who are living and working who sometimes fall into that folk art category as well. Yeah, exactly. So it was sort of um, once folk art had taken off and had primarily looked to historical objects, um, there was kind of an, a movement to add more contemporary artists to this group. So you will see, um, this is actually a work that's part of, of the show by um, an artist who you may know as Grandma Moses. Um, and um, so there's an evolution amongst collecting interest to start to incorporate certain contemporary artists who were, who were working outside the art academy. And, and they tend to be referred to slightly differently as self-taught artists or sometimes controversially now um, outsider artists. Um, they're really the primary element that these works all have in common is that they were they were made outside of um, of the academy, but they follow you know really different traditions of um, of making. Um, you also start to see, let's see, I have a couple other examples of um, artists who would be more considered self-taught like um, William Edmondson, who was a sculptor. Um, whose work was actually part of a show at the Museum of Modern Art, which was an early champion of, of what we now call folk and self-taught art. Also someone like Horace Pippin, who was intentionally working in a style that um, has connections to a sort of um, uh, what is sometimes called plain painting, kind of a flatter aesthetic with less realistic modeling. Um, you know, I think it's it's an imperfect label. And um, from the beginning, there was a really positive democratic energy to the idea of folk art. So the whole point of the movement was to include artists who had been excluded historically. But there's also always been a little bit of a troubling undertone, um, you know, in the, this history of, of, of elite, often white urban collectors um, kind of claiming work being made by often rural artists who were less kind of um, le less educated uh, and perhaps um, had fewer financial resources. Um, so we take a very intentional approach at AFAM to how we talk about folk art now and really distinguish um, the, the fact that this is a, a category that came about through collecting history. But our goal now with this category is is different in some fundamental ways from what it was in the 20s and 30s and in the sense there's a very strong intention um, for us to ensure we're not using words like naive or primitive that have been used in the past to describe this kind of work but to really honor and elevate the creativity of these individuals um, and to create a space to shine a spotlight on, on these works that were previously excluded from the academic canon. So I think there's a sort of a curatorial intentionality that's really important to, um, to working with folk art um, that makes sure we hold on to that initial um, really positive democratic gesture, but make sure we're leaving behind that sort of troubling um, sense of uh, kind of a little bit of a patronizing attitude that could sometimes come about um, through this kind of labeling. I like thinking about that intentionality and maybe moving forward, flattening those hierarchical boundaries between fine art, decorative art, folk art, outsider art, and thinking about how to flatten that and yeah. have museums celebrating creative expression of all kinds and absolutely all. yeah and I think it's so it's also key to understand you know like folk art as a term gets a lot more attention and fine art is sort of treated as a neutral like term that doesn't get a lot of attention and it's almost like similar in some ways to to what you see with certain ethnic categorizations it's like fine art is not neutral fine art was developed as a way to ex to exclude and to say like this is better somehow and so folk art was a response to that um and I think that we're very much now in a place of wanting to flatten those categories um and um 
just recognize that there's such a, an incredible wide range. Creativity can come from anywhere. You don't need a fancy degree to have, um, to have you know, your work um, validated. And I think that conversation really parallels a dialogue that's happening in museums and, and a lot of industries worldwide. I think more and more museums are outwardly acknowledging, you know, museums themselves are not neutral. They primarily rise out from the interests of a private collector. The Frick Pittsburgh is the legacy of Helen Clay Frick, who was the daughter of a noted industrialist and an art collector. And so our museum and our collection is really shaped by her interests and what she felt like was really important, what art was important to put on the walls and for people to see and for people to learn from. Um, and that is always going to be a subjective um, kind of denotation. So I want to I want to jump ahead since we have the photo of Helen there. I'm really interested to hear who those early figures that were collecting folk art and elevating it to popular interest. So I think um, if for anyone who does know the Fricks collection, we are not a folk art collection. Um, Helen, Helen's collecting taste really followed her father's. So she was primarily interested in academic European art. We um, have wonderful examples of 18th century French, and Flemish and Dutch paintings, as well as 15th century Italian. Uh, but what I was thinking about is even though she wasn't collecting art, I think she still, she still recognized the importance of this movement and for folk art in general. Um, she had a vision of creating a kind of photo, photographic archive of every artwork in the world. So when she founded the Frick Art Reference Library in New York, she sent out teams of photographers um, who went on their American campaigns, is what they, what they called it. And they traveled all over the United States, taking images of paintings and sculpture, um, unpublished little known works in private homes and smaller museums. And it included a lot of folk art examples. So even though she wasn't personally collecting it, she definitely recognized the importance. But I'd love to hear about those early figures because they were a bit radical. Right? Yeah. I mean, I love I that first of all, I'll just say like the the resource, the the frick resource that you're talking about is incredible and something that, you know, I I rely on still. Um someone um else who was kind of engaging in this kind of documentation project is um Henry Francis DuPont, who um I always love to use this image of him because I feel like it really captures his intensity and and some of the you know uh perhaps challenging aspects of his personality but he had a vision um really uh he, he'd come from a family that I think um, in, in the same vein as Helen Clay Frick was really focused on European um, art traditions. And he did a little bit of an about face um, kind of early on and decided, you know, this is, it's time for me to focus on collecting American things and to telling, uh, you know, an American story of history through objects. And he built essentially, you know, one, one of the most expansive collections of Americana, both high style and folk um, uh, at Winter Tour, um, his his museum in Delaware, um, where uh, he, I did my master's program, and 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 it really began. Um, you know that that was all part of his vision to have that program of education in decorative objects or what is sometimes now called material culture, really encompassing a broad range that um, covers both. Um, sort of high style, more high style furniture and, and the folk aesthetic, which you can see an example of one of his period rooms um, at Winter Tour of a Pennsylvania German um, folk room, which includes fractor, ceramics, furniture, painted furniture, um, all kinds of objects that you would that you would also find examples of in, in AFAM's collection. So there was absolutely kind of a radical sense of some, you know, what some of these collectors were doing. Someone else who is really key here um, and who kind of fits into that generational um, paradigm that we were talking about is um, <clears throat> Electra Havemeyer Webb, who's pictured here as a little girl sitting on the lap of her mother, painted by Mary Cassatt, who was a friend of the family's. Um, her mother, Louisine Havemeyer, collected um, French Impressionism and 
um, you know, very much, um, I mean, I suppose radical for its time as well, but very much in a cosmopolitan European vein. Um, and uh, Louisine Havemar was horrified when her daughter Electra started collecting things like shop uh, figures and weather vanes for this massive project, which similarly to DuPont, and in fact, later inspiring DuPont, um, led to the creation of the Shelburne Museum in Shelburne, Vermont, which also has a wonderful um, collection of, of historic homes with, with period rooms, with um, decorative objects in it, as well as a collection of folk painting. Um, so these, these sort of pioneers were, um, often part of the same circles and 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 uh, connected with one another and, and fed off one another. Another really important relationship is the relationship between um, uh, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, who was one of the founders of MoMA, but also of the um, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller uh, Folk Art Museum in Williamsburg. Um, so, she, so her sort of, her interest, she had interest in both, um, uh, uh, modern and folk, which were very, um, which were more integrated at that time. Um, in, in fact, MoMA, and I think MoMA is sort of returning to its roots uh, in this sense in a lot of ways with, with recent installations at their show, but MoMA originally um, was, was um, you know, sort of combining folk art in its galleries with modern art, um, but eventually uh, the Rockefeller Folk Art Collection went to its own um, to its own institution in Williamsburg. Um, but in terms of partnerships, I just wanted to mention another figure um, who Abby Aldrich Rockefeller was working very closely with, and that was Edith Halpert, who has been um, uh, sort of a, a wonderful topic of, of, of research in recent years with a show at the Jewish Museum in New York and a wonderful accompanying catalog that talks again about her relationship to both modern art and folk art and how she was a champion of both together and um, actually was responsible um, together with uh, another colleague of hers for really um, uh, encouraging folks to refer to um, to folk art as folk art rather than primitive or um, any of the other names that had been applied to it. Um, and so in that sense, you can you can look to a figure like Halpert to really see how the 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 commerce of the art world shaped um, the collecting category. Um, I wanted to, you know, the, this so this legacy sort of continues beyond the 20s and the 30s with other figures like Nina Fletcher Little, whose husband Bertram Little was the director of Historic New England, which is a massive collection of of objects and and historic properties um, across New England, um, and she fed again off of of those who had come before her, um, and also created a. a a collection of folk art that is now on view um, in a in her country home in Essex, Massachusetts. So that can be seen too. And it's it's really wonderful to be able to see not only, you know, the legacy of of being able to see individual objects of folk art that come from collections generated by these collectors, but also to still be able to go back and understand the holistic vision that so many of these um, early collectors had for pairing folk art um, together and placing it in context and living with it. Um, so every, you know, places like um, Cogswell's Grant, Nina Fletcher Little's house, as well as the Shelburne Museum and William, Williamsburg and Winter Tour are all some really interesting examples of, of how these collectors envision these works in conversation with one another. That's really great, I love this. So can you talk a little bit more about that relationship between folk art and modern art? Because they are kind of growing at the same time, they're concurrent movements, and it seems like they would be really divergent, but I think there's there's more, <laughs> more of there's, a relationship than we think. Yeah, there is, and there's much more to the story. And I think, you know, you can see in a pairing like this, which these paintings have nothing to do with one another. You know, we have Modigliani on the right and a, a you know, a essentially unknown American artist um, painting a, a young woman in his own family on the left. Um, but there's just so, there's such a um, commonality of sensibility in terms of the sense of, you know, sort of simplicity of line and attention to the grace of these figures. And um, so you see with something like this, you know, the modern art movement 
it's not a coincidence. The modern art movement was recognizing something. They saw they saw these objects and they said, oh, that's that's what we're doing as well. We're trying to get at something um, fundamental um, in the expression of form that we see uh, a precedent for in our kind of artistic ancestry. And so you have a lot of modern artists who are looking to um, a kind of folk aesthetic as inspiration. And uh, here's an example of, of Charles Sheeler, who's um, uh, has created, and in fact was in residency at Colonial Williamsburg for, um, I believe a couple of months in the thirties and, and created images like this, um, representing a kitchen with all of these sort of, you know, objects of everyday life. He also created works, um, uh, based on um, his own country house in um, outside of New York City, um, which clearly show that inspiration, um, but are executed with a very modern, clean line sensibility. So um, other examples of artists who, again, you know, we're often in the same circles, but Yasu Kuniyoshi, here we see with this weather vane, he's incorporating folk objects into his compositions. Um, Kuniyoshi was was someone who was part of an early um, uh, folk art um, uh, group um, organized by Juliana Force of the of the Whitney, um, and also um, was a visitor to uh, East, uh, Hamilton Easter Fields uh, uh, artist colony in Ogunquit, Maine, which was a sort of an incubator space for um, artists who who. Um, went up to live kind of a simpler life in these shacks, um, these sort of fishing shacks and, and developed an appreciation for things like weather vanes and decoys and hooked rugs that were um, that were sort of uh, there uh, for the um, for the inspiration. And then you see artists uh, also incorporating uh, or actually taking up folk uh, techniques like Marguerite Zorak, um, and here just for comparison as an example of a hooked rug from AFAM's collection. And Marston Hartley, who you know, you, you're probably more familiar with work by him, such as the example on the right um, of his sort of main landscapes, but he also created um, following his time, time that he spent in Germany actually, um, became interested in uh, tinsel painting, which was a tradition that, that was also um, both German and American, and he um, he he made some paintings in that vein. So, as a comparison, again, here's an example of a very similar um, um, technique with with some tinsel painting that's in AFEM's collection. Um, so, I, you know, I could go on about um, these these early. Uh, these modern artists for quite some time, but I think, you know, another helpful way to sort of think about um, the intersections between modern art and folk art is to, is to sort of see that these objects of everyday life were being treated as a kind of found, uh, found art um, by uh, collectors who, who were, were, were making creative gestures in their own right by saying, I claim this object, I, I'm, I'm turning it into an art object by my sort of act of choosing it. So with something like a trade sign, which, which was created for commercial purposes and would have been on display outside a shop to attract customers, then becomes, you know, in the similar vein to, to something like Marcel Duchamp's ready-mades, where he took everyday objects and, and elevated them as and presented them as art. It's a very similar gesture happening there. And I think need, to understand folk art, we really have to recognize and acknowledge the importance, you know, not only of the original maker's intention, but of the collector's intention in choosing something um, and see that there's creativity in that as well. I've never seen these two together, and I love this juxtaposition. It's so fantastic. <laughs> this is um, an amazing a trade sign in AFM's collection. It's huge. Um, it was made for a, a shop in in Vermont, and uh, you can't really appreciate it, the the wonderful whimsy of the figure um, from the photograph. But it's it's an incredible object. I'm really glad you got into those ideas about intentionality because I think visitors to American perspectives will see that some of the artists in the show 
are creating outworks expressly as an outlet for their creativity impulse. While there are a lot of other objects that are those made for everyday life objects that have then been aestheticized into the folk art category. And we have a really great question in, in the chat that was one of the questions that I was thinking about too is, you know, a lot of these objects start out as everyday utilitarian objects. What determines when they transition and become folk art? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's such a, it's such a great question. Um, I'm just sharing an example of a work that <clears throat> was recently on view at AFAM as an example of an everyday object that was uh, created for storage purposes in a colonial um, Connecticut home, um, but is now in an art museum. And, you know, again, I think it, it comes down to that kind of that that gesture of of choosing something like the the maker of this piece of furniture would not have considered himself an artist he would have and I say he because we're, we're pretty certain that this certain certainly the um the chest would have been made by a man uh some decoration was was painted by women but I think in this in the case of this particular object it was probably executed by the uh, the carpenter, he wouldn't have called himself an artist. He would have called himself a mechanic, actually, which was an old fashioned term for craftsman, or he would have called himself an, an artisan. And, and there's kind of a, you know, a long, long debate about this in the in the art world that goes back to um, the Renaissance and Baroque eras in Europe with, um, you know, artists producing treaties that in which you know, painters, fine art painters, what we would consider fine art painters are arguing strenuously about how they should be elevated to the status of a poet um, or another, uh, or a musician, or uh, there, there was really, um, there was really an argument going on for some time about, um, you know, whether a painter could be considered a, an artist or a technician. And I think you see similar arguments about that with, with figures in colonial America, like um, John Singleton Copley, um, who, um, you know, really wanted to be, wanted to stand out as, as someone on a level with, um, with uh, other members of kind of a, a, a burgeoning um, uh, upper middle class. And so there's some really interesting and complicated uh, discussions to be had about um, about that question. Um, some other so, examples, though, if I think, you know, this, this uh, artist on the right here, this incredible work of sculpture by a, a man who was a carpenter during the course of his working life. Um, and uh, then in his uh, sort of retirement, he decided he wanted to start making these like fantastical, whimsical objects that have no utilitarian purpose. And so you can see there, even within one um, maker's career, a uh, trajectory between, you know, making utilitarian objects and then using that energy and using that skill to really declare himself a maker of art objects. Um, and you know these these were works that he displayed in his lifetime, um, and uh, were then later kind of rediscovered by folk art collectors, um, and he was championed as an artist. Um, but it's a it's a slippery kind of um, uh, distinction. So some of the artists will be anonymous, and some of the artists might be unknown or new to us, but there's also a couple of names that are really iconic. Can you tell us about some of those more familiar names that we might recognize in the show? Yeah, so um, we talked a little bit about Grandma Moses already. I'll just, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about her. So um, she became really intensely popular, um, I think. Um, as a result of the fact that she was she was she was painting during the aftermath of um, the Second World War, and she really captured a desire on um, the part of Americans to look back towards sort of a more cheerful um, moment in history. Um, Grandma Moses, whose real name was Anna Mary Robertson Moses, um, was another artist who took up. Um, her practice later in life. And you see this theme a lot throughout the show and throughout folk art in general, you know, these 
um, people who who were you know during their their younger years were caring for families were were working to earn money and then it's it's only later in life that they they have the freedom uh, to to you know pick up the paintbrush or pick up some other medium and in the case of Grandma Moses she actually was um, a long time. Uh, needle worker, uh, but in her later years, she became arthritic. And so this was her alternative, um, which just she became intensely prolific. You can see she lived to be 101 um, from, you know, before, <laughs> 1860 to 1961. Can you imagine living across that lifespan and all the changes, changes that she saw? So she's really looking back to, you know, her memory. Um, but she came. She became really intensely popular because uh, she was, you know, someone who was shown in New York City at a gallery there, and then her work ended up gracing the covers of magazines and Christmas cards. And uh, there was a Grandma Moses Day declared in her honor, and so she really became something of a celebrity. She's still one of the best known American self-taught artists. Um, but we also have artists in the show, including um, Edward Hicks who may be a familiar name to, to many. He was um, both a preacher and a Quaker um, preacher and an artist. Um, and you can very much see his religious beliefs reflected across the body of his work with, in particular, the peaceable kingdom, which he had a little bit of an obsession with, this theme of the peaceable kingdom from the Bible, um, in which um, in a metaphor for, for harmony, we have the... the um, the lion laying down with the the lamb, or the and the the wolf laying down um, beside animal an animal that would normally be his prey. Um, so you see these unlikely pairings here, um, and this is is really thought to be a response to um, some strife in Hicks's own life during a, a time when um, Quakerism was um, uh, there was a dispute between two different sects and um hicks really was was um expressing his desire for for harmony with the repetition of this um this theme which gets repeated over and over again in his oeuvre um another familiar well maybe less familiar to um outside the folk art world but a, but really an iconic folk artist um is a a pair of artists ruth whittier shoot and her husband dr samuel addison shoot who painted um, portraits together. Um, one of them would do the underdrawings, the other would do the painting. I always forget which was which, but we know we know um, we know that this was the case because they signed their work as such, um, and they became incredible um, uh, uh, documenters of the lives of of women and young girls who worked um, in um, textile mills in New England towns um, during this this moment in the 1820s and 1830s when there was this burgeoning industry and for the first time um, many um, uh, girls and women from uh, rural um, farming communities had an opportunity to go to these these larger towns and. Um, develop a measure of financial independence, so they would have some spending money um, to to purchase a portrait, which for the first time was was really becoming um, in the early 19th century available to a wider swath of the public. Um, partly because of itinerant uh, artists like um, like the Shoots, who worked in uh, watercolor, which was a cheaper medium, um, and um, just made these these incredibly evocative portraits and you can always recognize the shoots um for the this characteristic of the, the kind of radiating background with these these swaths of blue and then they also often incorporated you can't quite see in this picture but um foil in the accessories so um when you when you see this work in person you have a close look at the earrings and the the brooch that she's wearing and you'll see they're um they're they're luminescent um, I'll maybe do just a couple of more iconic artists. Um, Am I Phillips uh, was a um, really a really important painter of um, a developing rural um, um, elite in uh, the sort of border areas of New York State, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Um, and for the longest time, it wasn't clear that his work. Um, he also had a really long life. And it wasn't clear um, that his work uh, was all by the same hand. Um, 
until um, some pioneering researchers were able to establish that, yes, those paintings that he made in the, you know, 1815, when he was still developing his aesthetic, are made by the same artist who made paintings like this from our collection. Um, much later, uh, towards the end of Phillips's life, um, he created this painting of three children um, from Stockbridge, Massachusetts, um, and uh, we have a number of examples of Phillips's work in our collection. I think we're really, um, uh, you know, one one of the one of the museums with the largest collections of of works by this artist. Um, but he was just so important at kind of, again, democratizing portraiture, making portraiture available to, um, uh, you know, not no longer just the urban elite um, as it had been with. Um, you know, the likes of, of John Singleton Copley in Boston in the 18th century. And then uh, we have artists um, like Clementine Hunter, who uh, was working in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and this is um, an example of a number of works that we have by this artist in the collection. Hunter, uh, like Grandma Moses, actually, was... Um, someone who, who took up painting later in life. She painted from her experience um, documenting the, the lifestyle uh, uh, of, of the South. She was living in Louisiana. She lived um, on a plantation um, in Natchitoches where she, uh, there was essentially sort of an artist's colony um, that was developing there, um, which piqued her interest she you know took up some materials that have been left by behind by um, one of the artists at the at the colony and asked uh, whether she could you make use of them and um, again like like grandma Moses just the once she started she couldn't stop and she just produced a, a hugely prolific of, of works um, this is kind of an unusual example um, because you more typically see her figures at work um, or sometimes going to church. Um, but so this is sort of a rare moment of leisure to have these women playing cards. Um, but often, you know, you will often see uh, almost exclusively her figures are placed outside. And so that sort of sense of the outside being one's, one's living space. This is one of my favorite works in the show. I had the opportunity to see it in Asheville and I was just completely charmed by this. It's larger in scale than I anticipated and and just really, really endearing. <laughs> There's something <laughs> wonderful about the colors. Um, I love listening to you tell all of these stories because I think one thing about the show is it is very deeply about storytelling. Mm -hmm. Every single artwork we could really sit with and do an entire program about. There are stories about how it was made, how the artist came to be an artist um, who might have used it or owned it, I think it's it shows the power of objects and artworks to convey those narratives. What are some of your favorite stories that visitors can expect to see in the show? Yes, I mean that's absolutely the 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 sort of generative idea behind the show, um, which. Um, was curated by Stacy Hollander, um, my predecessor at AFAM. Um, and uh, she really made selections. I mean, every object can tell a story, right? But she she made selections within the collection that really spoke to um, to that richness um, and to telling um, to telling unique stories. Um, I think for for me, one of the most incredible objects in our collection, um, and and certainly in the show, is this jug by David Drake, um, who whose name actually has become very current because there have been a lot of um, uh, of high. Uh, high um, value results for his work in, in recent years. Um, there's also a show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art right now that focuses on the pottery of Edgefield County, South Carolina. Um, but David Drake, um, who has formerly been known as, as Dave the Potter for, for the fact that he signs, he signed his work, Dave. Um, you can you can see that here in this example. Um, 
where he has signed this pot. Um, he was an enslaved man working in South Carolina at the at the potteries there. There was a massive pottery industry in this area, um, but uh, uh, he really he distinguished himself um, from from. Um, other potters at this time by by signing his work and in fact by often including um, verses uh, from the Bible or sometimes of his own devising on these jugs that were used for utilitarian purposes and scholars have suggested that he may you know he was of course he was expressing his his own ideas in a kind of remarkable display of um, a resistance against the the deadening and and um, oppression of, of enslavement, um, but he may even have been um, creating opportunities for other enslaved people who would have been working with these containers to, um, to gain accessibility to, to letters um, and numbers. And, and this was, um, you know, um, a way, uh, this, this sort of access to letters would have been a way that other enslaved folks, including Frederick Douglass, Learned to um, learned to read, taught themselves to read at a time when it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read um, in the South. So, an incredible object of of resistance, an incredible symbolic object, and also a really beautiful object with this um, this alkaline glazed stoneware. So, so definitely look for that. Um, I'm also a, a huge fan of this paint decorated chest, which is unusual um, in the way that it really, uh, it's it's very architectural in form, um, which is, is a Germanic um, um, uh, style. Um, and we know that this work was, um, was owned by a member of the uh, the, uh, the a German uh, family, the Kniskerns, in Schoharie County, New York, which was an area settled by by German immigrants. Um, Jacob Kniskern was the name of of the the, the owner of this chest, and, and we know that because it's it's inscribed Jacob um, and Kniskern here, and then the date seventeen seventy eight. So seventeen seventy eight turned out to be a, a really challenging year for this family. Um, uh, Jacob Nistern was uh, actually um, enlisted uh, as a patriot in the revolutionary cause, but he was captured and, and sent up to Canada um, as a prisoner of war. He managed to escape and make it back down to his home county, but when he arrived, he found that the, the community had been devastated by British troops. Um, but we do know um, because of, of some documentary records that he, he survived this um, transition and, and flourished later in life. Um, and by the time he died, he owned a number of blanket chests like this, which, which would have been used to um, to house um, exceptionally valuable goods in the household, textiles in particular, which would have been amongst the most valuable goods that you could own in the 18th century. Um, so to own a number of objects like this would have would have shown your your affluence um, that you would have sufficiency of of goods to keep um, to keep within a chest like this. So again, like not necessarily a lot of specificity to this story, but so much that we can learn from looking at an object like this. Um, how many more do we have time for? I don't want to. <laughs> well, I I don't wanna... say, yeah, we have some really great questions in the Q and A and in the chat. Um, yeah. Well, let's so take... maybe we'll turn to some of those. And I, Deborah has a question. I want to make sure we address hers. She is still a bit confused about folk art versus modern art. For mm -hmm. example, are Andy Warhol's works regarding Campbell soup cans, for example? And I, I think that's getting back to the kind of everyday functional object mm -hmm. being aestheticized and kind of turned into an artwork, even if it was not intended. But I will let you answer that question. <laughs> hey, that's a really interesting question. I hadn't really thought about it that way. I mean, I think that so modernism represents like a real like a huge rupture right in the kind of timeline of art history and you kind of can't go backwards from that once the sort of the pandora's box of modernism has been opened and you have people like marcel duchamp saying this urinal is an art object like uh, <laughs> everything that anyone knew before is like gone out the window so um 
you know, unless you have have an artist like um, like Grandma Moses, who's really saying I'm inspired by by this uh, this older um, format, and I'm and I want to capture. Um, I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sending myself to art school. I'm really relying on my own resources. Um, Andy Warhol was very much engaged with the cosmopolitan um, scene. You know, he was in New York City. He was, I think, I think you're right though. Like he's, he's doing something um, interesting and, and um, quite clever by, by saying, I'm going to appropriate these everyday objects that someone wouldn't ordinarily think of as art and, um, and incorporate them into my work, um, and, and, and even to, re to repeat them in this, in this kind of provocative way. Um, so he was a folk art collector, um, Andy Warhol, and, um, he was actually involved with the American Folk Art Museum at one point, um, in his lifetime. So I, I mean, I think like he, he was a, an amazing mind and I, I have to say, like, I'm sure he was thinking about questions like that. Um, but, you know, I don't think there's anyone who would consider him as a, as a folk artist just because he was so plugged into the art world. And um, he, he is typically sold within another super nebulous category called contemporary art. Um, and there's a lot of slipperiness in that realm, too, with someone like, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, who started as a street artist. And, you know, sort of how do we classify him? And are some of these folks who are now referred to as self-taught artists like Grandma Moses, you know, would they be considered contemporary artists if they had come up within um, an, uh, an urban environment instead of a rural one? Um, so there's still kind of that, there is absolutely um, still kind of a, a, a residual problematics of who is who is getting to refer to someone as a as a folk artist or self-taught artist who's doing that labeling and and is it really how the artist him him or herself would think of of themselves i hope that is helpful and not just more confusing but <laughs> there is my deborah right i think just showing how how blurry those boundaries are and and how subjective the categorizations can be that make something this and another thing, this category. So from Maria, we have when and why does a practical object, furniture, kitchen utensils, knitting, embroidery become folk art? And it's, I'm going to pair that with a question from someone else who said, how old do these objects have to be to be folk art? Because I think they're, those two are connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, again, this is like a, this is a frustrating a question that's going to have a frustrating answer. I, I would say like, there's no there's no rule about how old something has to be, um, but it's really interesting to note that um, when you're looking at kind of what comprises what's considered or what sort of uh, folk art collectors today might see mm -hmm. as kind of the folk art canon, like those artists are primarily 19th century, um, and they don't often include nowadays 18th century portraitists um that's sort of often looked at a little bit differently um and i i think it's an aesthetic it's an aesthetic reasoning i mean it's again it goes back to this idea folk art is what folk art collectors have decided it is <laughs> um and I think folk art collectors have historically privileged the aesthetics of the 19th century and not been as interested in the um in the 18th century. But you could certainly consider, you know, if we're looking at the definition, which I really use, which is folk art is anything that was not made within an academic setting, you can absolutely consider 18th century American portraiture as folk art. Um, you know, it was made by artists who, for the most part, unless they were coming over from, from Europe, um, they were they were teaching themselves um, how to paint within a really limited environment where there was no art school in you know 18th century Boston. Um, so you know so that's that's kind of a um, an, an answer that's not really an answer to that question. <laughs> What was the first part of that about samplers? When do they get considered? Yeah, when and why does a practical object become folk art? 
I think it's really about, you know, aesthetic power. Um, mm -hmm. Something that's just sort of a an object that doesn't have an, an embellishment to it. Um, it's probably not going to be considered something that um, that we would look at as an art object, um, but a, a paint decorated chest um, or um, uh, you know a, 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 a stoneware jug that that has um, uh, paint decoration or in the case of Dave Drake, you know this this expression, this creative expression through his his signature of the works. Um, that's, that's really the driving, that's really the driving factor is that as aesthetic component. So there's another great question. There's a couple of really good questions and I hope we can take a couple of more. Um, how did these artists become recognized by a larger audience? And maybe I'm wondering if this question yeah. was referencing anyone in any artist in particular, thinking about even Grandma Moses, how she was discovered and shown in right. New York galleries. Right, or yeah. Or Clementine no, Hunter. Um, that's a great yeah. question. So um, there's a, you know, it's, it's really the exhibition history uh, of these works, which starts in the, in the 1930s with a, a seminal show um, organized by the um, a, a friend and and uh, romantic partner of um, Edith Halpert, whose name was Holger Cahill, and he uh, organized a show called the the Art of the Common Man, um, which was very influential, um, and it sort of you know rolls along from there. Part part of it is is um, you know the publicity around um, uh, sales at auction as well. So um, especially, you know, jumping further ahead in time to um, the 1970s and 80s when folk art is really at a market high, um, you, you know, um, see interest generated by those sales. Um, but there are a series of really important exhibitions during that time as well, including this um, really influential show organized by Alice Winchester and Jean Lippman at the Whitney Museum of American Art right around the time of the bicentennial, which was a moment of, of a lot of energy around American history. Um, and so you see catalogs coming out to accompany these shows. Um, there are also, you know, a lot of, of there's, there's a lot of regionalism in folk art and appreciation locally for, um, you know, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, for instance, Pennsylvania German folk art, um, where there have been sort of local champions of particular, um, you know, specialized forms like fraktur or a particular technique of uh, uh, making uh, making ceramics or, or furniture. Um, so you start to see local historical societies and museums um, kind of generating interest in these objects as well. But then you do have with stars like Grandma Moses, artists who come to the attention of, you know, urban gallerists um, who, who really promote uh, one particular artist. Um, and then you have, um, you know, special collections that were formed by folks like the pioneering collectors I've mentioned, whose collections entered major museums um, and became part of the conversation that way. So there's a follow-up question. How many of these artists were recognized during their lifetimes for those who can be attributed by name? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it can't, it can't really be, be quantified, but I think, you know, there was many of these works were being made for, for sale. So um, if, if there wasn't, uh, if, you know, the, if Amy Phillips hadn't been able to sell his portraits, he would not have made them. Um, they were, they were made to support his, to him and his family. Um, so, you know, to the extent that recognition, it's sort of a different paradigm though, for what recognition is like, Amy Phillips didn't have recognition as, as, you know, an artist in a museum because museums didn't really exist in the sense that we understand them at that point in time. It was still a very, uh, the country was very young in terms of the establishment of institutions. Um, he was, you know, someone like Phillips was was absolutely sort of um, would have been someone that that folks trained in a more academic setting would have turned their nose up at. And in fact, there's 
um, or, or would have sort of treated with a certain patronizing attitude. And there's an amazing quote by um, um, the artist, the academic artist Vanderlyn actually, who talk, who references Am I Phillips and says, oh gosh, maybe if I could start all over again, I would like to just be like a simple academic painter like Phillips. I'm like maybe his life must be quite nice. So <laughs> there's definitely a sense of uh, condescension um, amongst artists who who were sort of established in in the academic world by the um, the middle of the 19th century as these institutions and, and ideas start to develop further. But Phillips, you know, on on the flip side, he was recognized by his patrons, um, and they recognized him by by you know neighbors and and folks who had seen other examples of his work commissioning his work. And you actually see like there's a, a lot of um, you know, he absolutely was spreading the word through through networks within communities because you 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 will see um, uh, his you know he paints for one person in the neighborhood and then he he starts painting others. Um, so that was absolutely how he operated. So maybe a final question. Um, this is something you and Lisa and I were talking about last week. Um, what about the art of indigenous peoples, such as Aboriginal paintings? Is yeah. that considered yeah. folk art? And maybe That's we can talk about the broader, like this show is really looking at American folk art, but there's absolutely a folk arts tradition in other countries as well. Yes, that's a really great and important question. Um, so Indigenous art uh, uh, of North America, in particular, has often been considered um, as its as its own specialized category. Um, uh, much of what um, has been, you know, collected in the Anglo-American folk art tradition, um, sort of fits within certain parameters and and kind of techniques um, that are really quite quite different from um, the, the techniques uh, and meanings of um, indigenous objects. And so it's uh, really, they've really developed in, in some ways as, as separate collecting categories. Um, and, you know, an example of, of, how, of how that's impacted the field is that AFEM has not traditionally collected Native American objects. Um, I think there's a, um, you know, a complicated set of considerations there. Uh, you know, should 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 this be considered a folk art category, or you know, do we, in the spirit of wanting to actually be flattening categories at this at this point, you know, what is it actually? What would it be doing now for 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 us to try to layer another label on top of? Um, that that hasn't historically existed. Um, so I think that's just a little bit of history. Um, although, you know, the collecting of indigenous objects and the collecting of American folk art have been aligned um, and have been, you know, connected and, and shown together in certain collectors, um, you know, visions for collecting. But indigenous art, I think also, and this is really under credited, but I, I think has, played a huge role in modern art aesthetics as well with figures like Jackson Pollock, who was really borrowing from a lot of um, indigenous traditions and that, that that's not widely recognized. Um, but there's some great scholarship um, on some of these questions, including a book by Elizabeth Hutchinson at Columbia um, called The Indian Craze, um, which is about um, this a really intense interest in collecting indigenous objects in the, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And then there's a really great book, the title, which I can't remember, that is about Jackson Pollock and um, his uh, the ways in which he was inspired by, by Native American art. Um, so those are some really interesting resources, I think, to, to hear, to learn more about um, intersections between these fields. Was there a second question? <laughs> there. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you, Don. I'm muted. <laughs> as long as we've been using Zoom and that still happens. Uh, yeah. This is really, really fantastic. And someone put in the Q&A just how 
how impressed they are by your knowledge and your ability to explain it. And I, I can't agree more. I think this has been a really fascinating talk and it's so interesting to think about this folk art genre growing up at the same time that Helen Clay Frick is um, on the board of the Frick Collection in New York and planning for her own museum to open in Pittsburgh. I think thinking about these things in context and how they relate to one another is is really, really interesting. And I hope that we have piqued everyone's interest and we will see you all in the galleries soon. Um, this will probably be available online. We um, have reported it, so we'll be happy to share the link around. And if you have any other questions, if we weren't able to address and address it during the program, do reach out and I'm sure Emily or I will be, be happy to, to chat yes. further. Yes, always happy to talk folk art. And I'll just say, um, Lisa's put it in the chat too, but I am going to be in Pittsburgh in November um, on the 11th, and I'll be giving a talk um, that focuses on more stories from, from American perspectives. So uh, it would be great um, to have to have you join us. Yes, it'll be great to have you in person and share more of these fantastic stories. So really check out our to website to register for the program. And thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.